Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about resilient machine learning, which is the set of tools and techniques that we utilize to launch artificial intelligence technologies into production in a way that is resilient to the kinds of issues that tend to plague any kind of software system and especially tend to plague machine learning systems that are boosting SaaS products and making products more effective. These kinds of techniques are very powerful. They have the ability to accomplish things that are not possible using traditional types of technologies or really in any other way. However, they have a number of major flaws and a number of major vulnerabilities that make it difficult for engineering teams to be able to deploy them confidently in production. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about what are the nature of these flaws? What are the nature of these challenges? And how can we improve how the systems that we deploy face and overcome these challenges? Let me just make this a little larger. All right, uh, so just a little bit about me. My name is Dan Schiebler. I'm the head of machine learning at Abnormal Security. Uh, at Abnormal Security, we build cybersecurity products to protect users from the from uh, bad actors, ransomware, BEC, uh, business email compromise, uh, phishing and spam. And we do this by launching machine learning algorithms that can detect cyber attacks and distinguish them from So my background, I, I did my undergraduate at Brown, a PhD at Oxford. Uh, before Abnormal, I worked for Twitter for years, working on a, a variety of different areas around ads, uh, etc. And before that, I worked at True Motion, an insurance company uh, focused on, on smartphone sensor analytics. Uh, just a, a little bit about me personally. I like the outdoors. So here's, here's a couple of pictures of me in the outdoors. Uh, all right. So the first challenge that we're going to talk about today is outages. So software outages are a very common staple of any software system where there's always the risk that a major incident occurs that can knock software systems off. And when this happens, machine learning systems that depend on everything in an environment being stable and working well can fail catastrophically. Software systems need to have the ability to be resilient to individual components of them breaking. Machine learning systems, especially when they're built and trained with only clean data, tend to react poorly and in unexpected ways when you have issues like a data center going out or a service taking longer than expected to spin up. The philosophy that I like to uh, suggest when trying to address this problem is to not coddle the models that we train. Uh, if we build a machine learning model that is intended to function in a production environment where different kinds of data distributions may change, different types of services may go out, then we want to build our model in a setting in which the data that is utilized to train and improve and test the model is representative of the possibility of these kinds of outages and incident situations. If we build our models in a academic-like environment only on clean data and in a clean environment, then when we launch our model into production, it will have a situation so somewhat similar to what's happening to this boxer here. Uh, you spent all your time punching a bag, then when you are faced with an actual opponent in a ring, you will uh, fail. But we can train our models to be resilient to these kinds of incidents. By logging data that represents the true production environments that our models are trained in, and training our models explicitly on that data, on data that represents the production environment, it represents the possibility of outages. 
we could build a model that is more resilient and is capable of resisting the kinds of incident situations that software systems will face. And so I'm going to tell, I'm going to make this a little bit more concrete with a comparison of two different models that we had at Twitter, uh, both of which were intended to serve ads to users. So one model was trained continuously on all data. So any ad request that was sent through the Twitter pipeline that met some relatively lightweight sets of criteria would be utilized as a training sample for this model. This includes samples that were submitted with noisy features or missing features from incidents, outages, situations where a user's Twitter account was had really poor service and they weren't able to send all their data. So really spotty samples. Whereas another model was trained by uh, ML researchers with an academic background who started by cleaning their data very aggressively and removing all of these samples with missing signals and missing features before beginning the training process. The two models had different architectures, but the architectural differences were not dramatic from the perspective of how it impacted the, the model performance. But when there was an incident, both models happened to be running at the same time. And the model that's trained continuously on all data had its performance barely change. When feature serving was delayed, the model that's trained on all data and has seen these samples with missing features and with missing signals had no problem adapting to this delayed serving situation, which had, had occurred due to a service taking too long to spin up. Whereas the model that had only seen clean data completely tanked. It wasn't ready for that kind of noise. At Abnormal Security, we need to build models that are resilient to any kind of incident situation. Our customers depend on our models to protect them from bad actors, to protect them from cyber criminals. And so it's critical that we build models that provide multi-layer defense, that it's resilience to any kind of interference that might happen or any kind of incident that might happen on our side that could reduce the effectiveness of our uh, defense systems. So in order to accomplish this, we utilize a multi-layered defense system where a sample does not just go through the phase of heavyweight models with heavyweight signals, but instead we have multiple layers of models, each of which have different kinds of signals that they depend on and therefore different risk profiles. The basic heuristic system is able to provide a base layer of defense that is not going to degrade if our signal provider systems go down. Similarly, our lightweight model with light signals does not have the same risk vectors as our heavyweight model may have, where certain heavyweight signals may not be available, but our lightweight model and basic heuristic systems are still able to provide defense. So this enables our system to not fail catastrophically and instead have sl slow, graceful failures in the deployment of the ML models. The insight here is that the individual models themselves may have a higher risk vector than the system as a whole. We can defend risk at the level of an individual model by trying to direct its training to make the model able to stand up in the ring to these kinds of incidents. We can also build our system in a way that utilizes a chain of models, each of which have different risk vectors, and utilize both of these approaches layered over each other to prepare our system for different kinds of incidents and build in this kind of resilience. The next kind of resilience that I want to talk about is adversaries. Any kind of product that is any degree of successful will face adversaries who are looking to exploit the weaknesses in the product in order to achieve their own gain. In social media settings, this could be spammers or people who are trying to gain the recommendation algorithm to gain more impressions or followers than the quality of their posts may deserve. In cybersecurity, this is of course an absolute cork part of the entire domain. The When we build cybersecurity defense algorithms, our adversaries will test their approaches 
against our defenses and modify their attacks based on what they believe will allow them to get through our defenses. So it's a constant game of escalation on building new systems that are resilient to adversarial interference. Fighting adversaries requires building a suit of armor around the models and systems that you build. And there's many different elements of this, but three that I usually like to highlight are high variance behavior, multiple layers of defense, and automated adaptation. So digging into this, what this means by high variance behavior is that the defenses that your systems provide are not simply focused on a single kind of defense or a single kind of model, but instead are driven by models whose behaviors are difficult to predict and able to defend in many different ways. And this feeds into multiple layers of defense. Having different kinds of systems that utilize different kinds of defenses make it harder for a single exploit to be particularly large. If an attacker figures out a single kind of way to fool your system, you want to make it difficult for them to be able to build on that exploit to fool your system in lots of different kinds of ways. You want each individual insight that an attacker is able to gain to be not something that allows them to gain many more insights after that. An automated adaptation is something that's critical to, to many machine learning systems and particularly important when fighting adversaries. This basically means that as new data flows in, you want your system to adapt to it. If a spammer manages to get past the spam filtering systems that are built into a social media site, you want the first user reports of that spam to immediately feed into machine learning models. The longer that feedback loop takes, the better that adversaries are able to exploit these weaknesses. One strategy that's important and very useful when fighting adversaries is to think carefully about the kinds of patterns that you are exploiting in the machine learning technology that you build. Generally, if we can frame many kinds of prediction, generally we can frame many kinds of prediction problems as finding a needle in a haystack. For example, on a application like Twitter, we are trying to find the single good ad, rep ad recommendation or content recommendation out of pool of thousands or tens of thousands of possible candidates. In the cybersecurity domain, we're trying to find the single piece of network traffic or the single message or email that is a cyber attack among the millions or tens of millions of messages or uh, parts of network traffic that are safe. But when we search for a needle in a haystack, there's different approaches that we can take. One is to try to model what does a needle look like, the metal, the shape, the sharpness. The other is to try to model what hay looks like and to look for the things in the haystack that don't look like that. When we try to model what a needle looks like, it's easier for the adversary who's trying to hide the needle to fool us. They may use a strangely shaped needle. They may blunt the edge of their needle. They may do all sorts of things that fool us looking for the characteristics of the needle in the haystack. However, it is much harder to build a needle that still functions as a needle that has all of the properties of hay. If we instead look for the thing in the haystack that doesn't look like hay, we can build an approach that is dramatically more resilient to attacker interference. I'm going to make this concrete. So let's say that we're building this kind of model and there's two different kinds of signals that we can we can think about there are signals that are easy for an attacker to impersonate and signals that are hard for an attacker to impersonate so for example in our twitter application signals that are easy for an attacker to impersonate are things like the account description or the account image or the follows that the account has made things the attacker has control of Things that are harder for the attacker to impersonate are things that are coming in to the accounts. The reputation that trusted accounts treat that account with, for instance. If we build a model that includes both easy to impersonate signals and hard to impersonate signals, we'll likely get the model with the best overall performance, just because we have the largest number of different signals. However, this model may be easier to fool because an attacker can impersonate the easy to impersonate signals. If we instead remove the easy to impersonate signals in the model training process, 
and focus our modeling on these hard to impersonate signals, we may build a model that has slightly worse overall performance, but we've built a model that's extremely difficult for attackers to fool. And this can be very powerful when we're in a situation where adversaries are our major concern. And to, to think about this in the, the social media setting, there's good content signals and bad content signals as well as additional dimensions that are easy and hard to fool. Good content signals like virality can be a little bit easier to impersonate. They're a little bit harder to impersonate than things as like content themselves, but they're still a little bit easier to impersonate compared to things like conversion rate and dwell time that rely on genuine user engagements and are much harder to impersonate. In the cyber attacker domain, we have the difference between attack signals and safe signals. When we're trying to identify whether or not a particular message is bad, if we look for known bad links or spammy representations of vocabulary, these are things that attackers can relatively easy, mo easily modify. However, if we're looking instead at how strange this message is for this particular, rep for this particular recipient, or what kind of reputation the sender has over time. These are things that are much, much harder for the attacker to fool and for the attacker to impersonate. And as a result, focusing models on these safe signals can enable us to build models that are more resilient to attacker interference. So the next domain I'm going to talk about relatively briefly is offline online mismatch, which is a major challenge when building and deploying machine learning systems or artificial intelligence systems that are intended to perform well in production in a way that is resilient to discrepancies between what data scientists and machine learning engineers see and what we actually see in production and this coin represents the the two sides of any artificial intelligence work stream the what the engineers see and what the users and customers see so we can think about the distinction between online and offline as the distinction between what a customer experiences and what a data science sees or experiences. The online system is going to be seen by our synchronous services, queues, jobs, the actual things that serve traffic to the customers and show the customer's experience. Whereas what the data scientist sees are queries, notebooks, scripts things that the data scientist has control over. And there's usually a gap between these where the size of this gap is directly related to the difficulty of data scientists optimizing with high bandwidth for the customer experience. And to drive this home, I just want to talk a little bit about what this might actually look like in a production environment where in an offline setting the tools and systems that a data scientist is working with may be entirely separate from the tools and systems that are actually serving models to the client for instance the training job that a data scientist or engineer is working with may have its signals hydrated from an offline feature warehouse that is stored separately from the online signal data store that provides signals to the online system. This is a gap in that this data may be copied or cloned, but it's likely stored in different formats and may have substantial discrepancies in the assumptions made or the values of the data that's, sort, that's served. This means that data scientists and engineers working on building and improving these models may run the risk of moving in the wrong direction due to this gap that exists between what the customer can experience and what the data scientists can experience. And one of the ways that we can improve upon this is by investing in offline simulation, where we store a unified data set that we clone 
to both an online system and an offline simulation system that copies the behavior of the online system. Essentially, to be more deliberate about the transformations and data processing that is performed by our, off our online systems and mirror them in the offline systems that data scientists work with. And I'm not going to talk too much more about this. What I want to focus on next is feedback loops, which are one of the largest challenges that engineers face when deploying machine learning systems into production, especially as these systems influence the customer experience. And this influence on the customer experience then influences the data that feeds into these systems. This kind of loop where the changes that we make influence the way that the system evolves in the future can be very difficult when we are attempting to improve the quality of our systems in a way that is visible and predictable. An easy example here is the case where an engineer builds a artificial intelligence model for catching a particular kind of attack in the cybersecurity setting, launches it into production. We have a day or two of good protection before attackers realize that this kind of attack is now being blocked, modify the kinds of attacks that they send, and now they're sending a different kind of attack. And what this means now is that the kind of data that's feeding into the machine learning model training has now changed. It's not just that the model is now dealing with a new kind of data, it's that the next model that we train will have this new kind of data, where this new kind of data is influenced by the previous model we trained. So this is a very complex set of dependencies where every decision you make today will not only influence the behavior of your model, but it will also influence the kind of data that feeds into the next model that you train. And so this is a sort of picture of what this looks like, uh, especially in a setting like Twitter, where we have users whose actions directly feed into the models that we build. Although this is very relevant in the settings like the one that we have at Abnormal Security, where customers and attackers are the providers of the data that feeds into our models. So we can start this with our training data. We have a set of data that an engineer is going to utilize to build a model. So they build the model from that data. This model also utilizes features that are attached to that training data the signals that we've associated with it. This model generates predictions in our production system, which then influences the user experience. The user's actions then feed back into both the training data and the features themselves. If these features are things like reputation, click-through rates, response rates, et cetera, these are themselves influenced by what the model had chosen to do. So the future behavior of the model and the future versions of the model are both influenced by these previous modeling decisions and data science decisions that fed into the previous versions of the model. This is often an endemic challenge with any kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence system. But there are steps that we can take to mitigate the impact of this challenge. And one way to do this is to be deliberate about separating the samples that feed into model training from the full set of samples that are influenced by our model. We could do this by building a system that selects samples from our live data and treats them differently from the samples that feed through our online system instead sends them directly to human labeling, for instance, without passing them first through a prediction process, essentially separating the flow of data into our database from just the flow that goes through a model. So we have sort of a two-tiered flow here, one flow that feeds through our model and online system, and therefore is influenced by previous model decisions, and one that is not. This enables engineers to be able to test their decisions, not just in a setting that is influenced by the previous decisions that they made, but also in an unbiased setting 
that enables continuous improvements and greater predictability into how systems will behave in the future. Thank you. Happy to take questions. That was awesome, Dan. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I uh, definitely took quite a few notes from your presentation. So uh, I okay. will leave the last 10 for about Q&A so the audience wants to open up any questions. I have a question for you. Sorry, I'm trying to move my mic here. If you don't mind. Ooh. So as a founder, as a company, like what is your prediction as far as like one, you know, one thing to look out for this year, you know, that, that, that you're predicting within your space? I mean, I think that one huge area, especially within cybersecurity is the rise of the rise of commoditized attacks has been a, a constant issue where technology makes it easier for bad actors to send out large spam uh, campaigns or even very, very targeted campaigns, very targeted attacks. And that has gotten substantially more dangerous as artificial tech intelligence technologies that enable highly personalized, but still very high volume attacks to be manufactured. Systems like GPT make it very easy to craft highly personalized, high volume scam messages or um, simulations of very real looking communications or uh, artifacts that can attempt to fool uh, detection systems. So I think that a higher vigilance for these kinds of manufactured attacks and modeling techniques that are resilient to them are critical for uh, the cybersecurity space and especially the AI and cybersecurity space. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I've definitely seen an increase in like spammy stuff coming through, especially, you know, via via email, um, but even like my phone. Uh, but overall, I think I think it's really interesting how, you know, well, how these bad characters, how they get real creative about how they like launch these attacks. I mean, it's 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 fascinating, even though it's a terrible thing. So, you know, someone that is not let's call it tech savvy or just like, you know, well in tune with what this looks like. What, what do you recommend? I mean, like what are like one or two, three, two, 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 three things that they can look out for um, just to make sure that they're doing their due diligence. Right. And, and just not being, you know, careless about, you know, clicking on, on a link or just going to the wrong side. Totally. I mean, the, the, I would say the number one most important thing to do in general for cyber security health is to have NFA on all of your accounts. I don't think there's anything more important than that, simply because it is too easy to get credential fished. And if, if you end up putting your password into the wrong place or have a security breach, uh, multi-factor authentication will uh, protect you in uh, many different situations. Whereas um, in any, any other form of vigilance, will any kind of vigilance will always have have gaps but this is a very very low effort and very very high reward uh, way to keep yourself safe very interesting well i appreciate you sharing that it doesn't look like any questions come in so i can continue the conversation for a little bit while we wait if, if you have some time that's all right totally awesome so where can people connect with you where can they find you linkedin twitter um email yeah both linkedin and twitter LinkedIn and Twitter are both uh, good places and reasonably active on both. Awesome. So, you know, I don't, I'm assuming you are well aware. I mean, I, I'm curious to know your perspective since you're in, in the industry. So I use LastPass and I know recently they had a little, little hiccup. So, you know, uh, with, with companies like that, you know, I mean, I don't know how much you know about it. I, and I'm, I just know, very bare surface because I was having dinner with uh with one of my mentors and I started to notice that someone was trying to log into like my Facebook. So good thing I had two factor authentication because I went and changed it, but it was just like crazy how someone was trying to like people can access your stuff, you know, and, and there's so many ways. He's an expert in email 
an email and privacy. And he was just explaining to me several things. And I was just like so fascinated by how these bad characters just really go about kind of implementing some of their tactics and strategy. So how, what are your thoughts on like the last pass, you know, kind of the latest breach and, and how, you know, what we can learn from that? I mean, I think com companies have a responsibility to be responsible custodians of user data. I think it's very difficult to balance each of the different decisions that companies make. There's different kinds of attacks that have uh, different types of blast radiuses. And it's very easy to look at a case like LastPass and point out multiple mistakes that they've made with respect to uh, data separation and respect to the uh, ability of attackers to be able to uh, apply this kind of exploit. But I think that fundamentally each type of uh, company and the types of data that they have need to be I need to be stored it as secure and low access way as possible. And as users, it's helpful to have no single point of failure. Utilizing techniques like multi-factor authentication and password turnover is always helpful because the reality is that companies will always make mistakes. Attackers will always uh, make exploits and each individual person is is it is it's important to realize that these types of risks exist yep yep so as far as maybe on a personal or, or for abnormal security i mean what are, what are y'all most excited to look to or look forward to in 2023 i mean what i don't know how much you can share about some of y'all's plans but you know what, what's one big thing yep. that you're looking forward to or excited about Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I think one thing is for us to continue to protect customers as effectively as possible. We are, we, we consistently are, are the highest performing email security product in the markets in terms of our ability to catch email attacks and prevent and detect account takeovers. I am very excited about continuing to improve our email detection capabilities through incorporation of new data sets, through incorporation of more sophisticated and more powerful machine learning techniques. I'm also really excited about how we are branching into new product areas and new forms of data that we are ingesting to protect our customers better and to provide a more holistic uh, cybersecurity defense through protecting against different kinds of messaging, different kinds of account takeovers, and different kinds of attacks. I Every time that we prevent a customer from losing money from invoice fraud, or prevent a customer from being extorted or scammed, or having their uh, credentials stolen, this is it's, it's nice to be able to have this kind of positive impact in the world and to be able to continue to improve our systems to improve the degree to which we can have this positive impact. So I'm, I'm excited about the new types of signals, the new types of models, and the new kinds of customers we'll be able to protect. No, that's amazing. That's definitely uh, very exciting. And I wish you all lots of success. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if you have any additional comments. I'd like to kind of leave the last question to basically what what is one piece of advice or, or one, one takeaway that you can give anyone, you know, going into 2023, uh, you know, as from a security machine learning privacy standpoint, or just from a personal level, like what, what's one thing that you'd give to all our founders or audience that are here with us today? And I mean, the, the theme of my talk today is largely around the, the ways that machine learning can be difficult. And that's and, and how to try to reduce the surface area of those difficulties. And I think that this is an important thing to keep in mind as we have excitement about the possibilities and potential of machine learning is to realize that machine learning technologies are extremely powerful, but they're also extremely difficult to apply in situations with high risk. Machine learning technologies are exceptional when the possibility of a catastrophic failure is very, very low. When there's a low risk that failure will cause really, really bad outcomes, it's very easy to apply machine learning and be willing to accept that risk. 
when we're working in any domain where catastrophic failure has a very, very catastrophic potential outcome, then the application and optimization of these kinds of technologies becomes much more difficult. So my suggestion to anybody who's interfacing with these technologies is to start simple and stay simple as long as possible to be able to really understand what are the characteristics of the, your domain? How sensitive are you to catastrophic failure? And what are the ways that you can prevent against it and minimize the risk? This will allow the incorporation of machine learning technologies into your product and into the systems that you're building to be maximally successful and not hit roadblocks or failures down the road. Oh, that's amazing. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. Well, Dan, I really appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. Uh, it's been an awesome conversation. That was super insightful, honestly, for me. At, and I hope it was for everyone else. But I'm uh, really looking forward to hopefully seeing you at another event here. And uh, thank you so for spending the morning with us. Absolutely. Great to chat. Thanks, Javi. Have a great day.